All right, so Oz Gamers did an interview here with Ian Hazikostas. Let's quickly see here. The big interview, uh, they say. All right, so when we start thinking about the beginning of any expansion, we delve into the Warcraft lore and history. Jeremy Fiesel, lead game designer on World of Warcraft, Dragonflight, says, What cool threads have yet to be unraveled? What stories and areas of the world have we yet to explore and conquer? One of the areas we've consistently gone back to is the backstory of the Dragonflight. Uh, literally, one of the reasons I am excited for the next expansion is exactly that. It's dragons. It's old. It provides so much scope for storytelling that you wouldn't get in any other expansion really because the dragons is very much intertwined with almost every other element of world of warcraft so all in all i think why not right imagine if the whole island was a dragon <laughs> that could actually work right there's a huge amount that we don't know jeremy adds the backstory of what happened in the past galakron era where the dragons met with the titans what happened between them and the dragons protecting the planet the future following that is something that we've never really delved into. So there's a lot of really cool story threads there to chase after. Oh my god, I just really hope that they pick two or three major threads and then maybe four or five minor threads. Use the minor threads to tease future stories and then take the three major threads and actually complete them. Do not pick up every single fucking thread for the dragons and everything that is in the dragons and then end up telling like half a story for each of these i, I really hope they they also took the scope of the story um like a lot more concise than than what it was in the past um dragons it's where world of warcraft is headed next more specifically the dragon isles a new and expansive location made up of five new zones one of which will be starting will be a starting area for a brand new class with Blizzard lifting the lid on World of Warcraft Dragonflight, the next major expansion for WoW, the long-running online role player, is leaving the cataclysmic events of the afterlife behind, and massive threats for that matter. For a more classically grounded tale, albeit one that will let you take flight and ride a dragon. Big question time chat, big brain five head question. We just spent the last three expansions killing cosmic level threats. We had to deal with Sargeras, we didn't kill him, but we did take down Argus. Then we dealt with Nazoth, part of the Void, cosmic level, very, very big bad. And then we went to the, the realms of death, where we basted the Titan plus, 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 plus. Fuck you, plus, I've, I've basically caused all of the shit that you've ever known in World of Warcraft. What possible enemy can be provided to the player base that we wouldn't be able to fucking one shot. Like, who's gonna do that explanation? You're you're going from taking down a Titan plus 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 infinity. Now this this little dragon is gonna provide some kind of problem for you. It's like it's like uh why would this be a problem for us at all? I would I, I need to see what this transition explanation is gonna be. Because it's it's important. It's important that they nail the transition from Shadowlands into the Dragon Isles. Because, of course, creating a new expansion with a dragon theme means the ability to ride one. Ahead of the big reveal, we had the chance to sit down with Blizzard to talk about the new expansion, the arrival of a brand new class and race with the Drakfu Revoker, and how this is a return to the classic storytelling and exploration of old. I'm telling you, man, the next big bad is the Baylor. He's an external one, plus plus, and was the one who was behind the jailer. <laughs> He's the one that provides bail for all the people that's jailed in the Shadowlands. Um, and that's actually why the jailer was so angry, because he was overcharging criminals. And the jailer thought, this is a fucked up justice system. I have to take it down. I like it. So far, I'm on board with that storyline. Okay, so... We've just come to the afterlife where there's this huge, crazy cosmic story in Zerath Mortis that deals with the Jailer in the first one, Jeremy Fiesel says. This is an opportunity for us to head back to Azeroth and into a very grounded space that feels like classic World of Warcraft. One of, one of the main focuses for this expansion is going to, to a place that's not necessarily about a world-ending threat. It's about history, it's about characters, it's about exploration. That's the name of the game. From the get-go, you're heading off on an exploration-based adventure. The groups that you set out with aren't even military groups. 
gonna be honest with all of you, I love that. I like that. I, I am pretty much over this world-ending bullshit. I'm over this, this is a really bad thing and it's gonna destroy World of Warcraft or Azeroth as we know it if we don't put an end to it and we all have to work together and somehow gain these, these giant fucking powers. I like this. I told you guys before, while I was watching the reveal trailer, I, I got this sense this is World of Warcraft doing classic 2.0. And, and I might be wrong, this is just a theory, but I think Blizzard realized that they can't pull off World of Warcraft 2 for a number of reasons. World of Warcraft 2 is too gutsy. It, it's way too, too dangerous because if it doesn't work, you just end up losing all your players anyways. I think this is Blizzard's ability. This is Blizzard's way of saying, okay, let's hit reset on all of our mistakes. We go back to a classic style story where it's the world that's important and you're going to explore the world. And yes, you're going to have dungeons. And yes, you're going to have raids. But these enemies aren't really enemies that want to destroy the world. They're part of Azeroth. They, they don't want to destroy the world. They're just enemies because you don't see the same way they do. And from here, there can be that building effect to a new era for World of Warcraft. So I'm very excited for that. Very, very excited for that. Okay, setting off to the new locale, the ancient Dragon Isles, we'll see you share a passage with the thinkers of, and explorers of Azeroth, the artisans, the historians, and the reliquary. Re reliquary? I don't know how to pronounce that word. The Explorers League. It's all about discovery and rediscovery. Why are the Dragonflights back and what is their purpose? That kicks off everything, Jeremy Fiesel explains. This vibe is going into an untamed, unknown space full of mysteries that we will have to uncover. Stretch my leg. The new zone and a new way to explore dragon riding. With Dragonflight, we wanted to create zones that feel like they hit that level of vastness that you want from a place where dragons would exist. Uh, almost everything has to be a little, a little bigger, a little bit wider. You want to have those giant rolling plains where a dragon can swoop down and munch up a whole bunch of primal sheep. With dragons in the mix, the team at Blizzard actively set out to create larger zones that players have seen in recent expansions. Places that the team now calls a little cramped. Going into an unknown and killing everything in sight? Pretty much what we're going to be doing here, I think. Um... We wanted to try and spread back out, get some of that classic Stranglethorn Vale feel. Um, huge expanses of trees and in between spaces where we can have wildlife and really cool uh, points of interest. Characters that might be lost out there, little vi vignettes to discover. I've never seen Blizzard actually pull this off. Have you? Chat. Have you actually ever seen Blizzard pull off zone design where the zone itself is truly interesting? And I'm more talking about modern day Blizzard, uh, where the zone is truly interesting and the zone really, like, makes you want to be in it rather than have various activities that forces you to be in it. The islands are on the map. Probably fucking huge, right? I would say Mop is a pretty good example of where that absolutely worked. True. I think Mop is a pretty good example of that. Just give me a second. I have a fucking mosquito here. I just want to put on some repellent. There we go. Fuck you, you little asshole. All right. Okay, here we go. Um, I'm not I'm not too sure how good Blizzard is going to be with this. Like, honestly, I'm not too sure. They're going to have to take a whole new approach to zone design. Unsure about the zone topic, but a lot of the language has been reminding me of BFA with ideas like stepping back, returning to adventure, etc. But I may be off in that thinking. Optimal book, I feel like in BFA, Blizzard sort of did take a step back because a lot of the zones in, in BFA were actually pretty cool and a lot of BFA wasn't absolutely horrible. It was the systems of BFA that made it horrible. But if you remove the systems from BFA, they're not bad at all. Luna, how are you doing? So ultimately, I think this is Blizzard sort of hitting complete reset on everything and saying, okay, let's go back to the drawing board. Let's go back to classic 2.0 and see how we how how we progress from this moment forward. Um, they need fixed gearing and how to get gear, not only by doing hardcore content. Well, depends on what kind of gear we're talking about, but I do agree with you. I'm here since I haven't been around in ages. Well, it is true, Luna. We haven't seen you in years, like literal years. Um... Well, in theory, they could just design a typical zone and blow it up to four or five times the size. In theory, yes, but that zone would be so fucking empty that you, the, the, <laughs> no one would want to be there. 
if you're going to design huge fucking zones, they, they have to be interesting and fun. Otherwise, th there, there's no sense to them. Dragon riding is very fast and fluid. It's arcadey, Jeremy explains. You press the space bar and you do a giant takeoff. Uh, and then the whole mini game is that you've got height and speed and you have to try to figure out how to get as far as possible before you land again. And it should feel like you're swooping and diving through these landscapes with giant zones. The two ended up working really well together. You're going to move really fast when dragon riding too, much faster than existing mount speeds. Hmm. So it's almost actually more gliding than it is flying, right? Uh, you're not actually flying. You're gliding. Not necessarily a system I hate because I have often said that I would replace flying in World of Warcraft with a gliding system. Because gliding does not afford you the, uh, the ability to just skip massive amounts of content, whereas flying does. So I kind of like the idea of you get to glide for a little while, and if you do it well, you can actually glide for quite long. But you do not get the ability to just fly and fly and fly and fly and fly as if it's never over. So I do kind of like this. And obviously, if you can manage it so you can pick up more speed by going down a mountain, you could probably glide for even longer. So if you do it right, you could absolutely do it very well. Um, but yeah, I, I like this system quite a lot. The idea of fully controllable dragons to mount and then explore the Dragon Isles was, uh, with, with was something that came together pretty quickly for the team. Having there be a mastery to it, but also an arcade-like accessibility was on the table, so to speak, right from the outset. Plus, a keen focus on making it look as grand as Graden riding should be. Taking off, there should be a giant gust of wind and a big flap of your wings, Jeremy adds. We're going to look for player feedback as soon as we hit alpha and beta to fine tune all of the little details, those little moments where we're finding uh, where we're finding where we need to add another animation somewhere because it doesn't feel quite right. All right, so far so good. They want us to beta test the game for them because they 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 don't want to hire quality assurance people. I I I feel you. I fucking feel you. You know, it's 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 expensive to make really good games without employing a vast amount of free workers. Sounds good. One thing I absolutely hated in WoW was flying straight down. Took forever and falling uh, and falling was faster. Yeah, but falling also had the downside of having to corpse run right after unless you had some way of stopping that fall. Um, flap your wings. Think advanced flappy bird. Um, all right, when creating the dragon riding aspect for the new expansion, the team at Blizzard quickly discovered that elements of the game world needed to change or be heightened to really sell that sense of speed. If you don't have elements in the game, well, in the game world, like clouds and little particles, it's hard to tell exactly how fast you're going, Jeremy says. Our environment team is doing a great job incorporating things like more cloud layers so that you can fly through the clouds and get that feeling of moving really fast. And then as you start to speed up and go faster and faster, you'll see particles fly off your wings. And eventually that turns into contrails. All right, there's a lot of effort clearly put into the dragon riding thing. A big push was to make the experience of moving around the world feel, feel more three-dimensional. The idea of conservation of momentum, of caring about when you stop, because you don't want to stop, you want to keep going fast. How do I get from A to B as fast as possible? Finding those different spires to jump off uh, jump off of becomes an interesting thing to look for as you're traversing the world. I'm a simple man, I like to go fast. Fast as fuck, boy. Just fast as fuck, boy. Introducing the Drakthir Evoker, a brand new playable race and class. Probably my second, second favorite thing about the announcement is the Drakthir. We knew we were making a dragon expansion and that we wanted to late. I, I want to ask you guys something. How do you feel about the one class, one race combination. So this race can only be this class and this class can only be this race. How do you guys feel about that? See, the reason I love, I love it, but I can understand why a lot of people don't like it is, okay, so first, why a lot of people don't like it. Some people may want to be a Drekthir, but they don't want to be an Evoker. Other people might want to be an Evoker, but they don't want to be Drekthir. So you are sort of limited in what you're allowed to choose and what you're allowed to do. And I fully, fully understand that. From a lore perspective, this makes a hell of a lot of sense. Because this race 
has literally not been anywhere near um, the mortal realms. So they know nothing other than what they were physically bred for. For those of you that don't know the story, the story of the Drekthir is that they are experimentations of, of uh, Nalfarian before he became Deathwing. So he turned them into these evoker class. Into this evoker class, this is what they do. It's all they can do. The reason I love it, outside of the lore reasons, because I'm a huge fan of lore, surprise, surprise. But the reason I personally love this is it gives you the ability to make a race far more high fidelity because the race is effectively built for this class. So you can build everything for this class into the race as well from the skeleton to the movements to the animations to everything is built from the ground up knowing exactly what this is going to do so i feel like you can get a hell of a lot more quality out of it than what you can do if you have a race that can be like a bunch of different classes uh, where you, you sort of have to like you can't spend as much time on the animations for that specific class because you have a bunch of classes that need that animation uh, so I, I kind of like it. Do I think that it should be a feature that happens often in World of Warcraft? No, it should absolutely not be a feature that happens often. Maybe the next class they announce should be a class for all races rather than because we, we have demon hunters that can only be elves. Yeah, we the, the one before that was monks and for a while pandas could only be monks. So maybe now is the time to start adding like again some classes that can be or some races even that can be massive things that isn't just a, a, a sort of a, what what are they called allied race right um like a proper race with its own skeleton and its own animations and stuff um that can do a bunch of things but i think every once in a while it's a nice refreshing change i don't hate this um all right so he says we wanted to let you play as a dragon, Graham Berger, senior game de designer on World of Warcraft. Dragonflight says, uh, with the new playable race being exactly that, Dragonkin, that was the guiding light, but we can't let you be Alexstrasza. You can't be 40 feet tall. That wouldn't work. Well, you could be 40 feet tall. It could work. It would be bonkers, but it could absolutely fucking work. Um, some dungeons you probably wouldn't be able to go into, but that's the price you pay. The team did an incredible job making this draconic humanoid model, the Drakthir. Getting to that humanoid size and then doing everything we could to merge physical and innate magical capabilities with the class design and the combat design was the goal. The Drakthir and Evoker are kind of one thing tied together. It's not just casting spells, it's using the in internal power of a dragon. As a ranged and mobile class, the Evoker is intrinsically tied to the Drakthir. This means the ability to use your wings to glide around the battlefield and cast spells, even though it's not a giant screen-filling dragon, it's all about delivering on the fantasy of being a dragon whilst fighting. Walk of Dragons, Drakthir abilities and spells draw on draconic magic as realized by the Dragonflights, these being red magic, black magic, and so forth. Evokers, though, can draw on all five styles. Red Dragon Magic and Blue Dragon Magic make up the more ranged DPS focus specializations, offering up faster explosive area of effect. Green and Bronze focus on healing for the DPS. Okay, so this pisses me off now. I'm being, I'm, I'm genuinely pissed off. He says here, Drakthir abilities and spells draw on draconic magic as realized by the dragonflights, these being red magic, black magic, and so forth. Evokers, though, can draw on all five styles, and then he goes on to mention four fucking styles. Where is the fucking black? Like, if it's all five styles, where is the black? It's, I mean, it's green and bronze for healing. It's red and blue for damage. Where's the black? Like I said, from a lore perspective, it makes sense if there's no black magic. Lore-wise, I can explain why there wouldn't be any black magic. And I said from the beginning, I think that by the end of the expansion, they're going to announce a new spec for the Evoker. Maybe a tank spec, and that's going to be black. So as soon as you unlock the, the black dragonflight, as soon as we rebuild the black dra dragonflight and actually give them an aspect, I can see black magic coming back to them. But don't say that they can draw on all five and then only give four without some kind of explanation um i hope it's not set up yet i'm more annoyed the healers isn't life binders colors <laughs> uh paranoid how you doing brother five spec class cries and demon hunter not five spec class just three spec class 
clearly the first dragonfly is the infinite. <laughs> you can't see it. It's the invisible one. Uh, for the DPS side, it also led to the creation of a new type of spell called Empower. One of the earliest spells learned in the new starting zone is a raid dragon spell called Fire Breath, an Empower spell that essentially means the longer you charge up the old flaming lungs, the bigger the flame and the more damage it will do. As evokers level up and delve into various talents, they'll gain access to more and more Empower style abilities. Due to the complexity of adding both a new race and class as part of the new expansion, a core team began work on this side of Dragonflight very early on. Why did they even give the class a special name? Why isn't Drek'thir just the class too? Uh, because I think Signal Warden, because they will eventually give Evoker to all classes. This is literally going to be another uh, Monk situation. At the very beginning, it was only pandas that could be monks, and then later on, Blizzard said the the, the pandas have now gone, now gone out and sort of uh, taught some of the other races how to be monks, and now the other races can be monks too. So I think this is going to be, a, this is for the expansion, a really good selling point, a sort of uh, the way for them to dive into the lore a little bit more, and then by the end of the expansion, they will obviously move, um, and, and they'll give other classes the ability to be evokers as well. Although, thinking about it now, how? There are some things that they can do, like fly around the battle battlefield and breathe fire that none of the other races can do. Unless, of course, you get new allied races that is half orc, half dragon, because the primalists were doing experiments on the mortal races. You could probably get that, right? Um, but doubtful. I don't actually know. I don't know why they decided to do Evoker and Drek'thir. Why not just call the Drek'thir the Drek'thir? Because they are effectively just, you know, the same class. Maybe they want to give themselves options in the future. If they do start adding maybe other types of draconic creatures as allied races, then those creatures can be evokers as well. Whereas if it was just the Drek'thir and there was no class, then that would limit them, right? Uh, now probably just because it might get another spec in the future. Well, if you just called it Drek'thir, you'd still have the ability to add new specs. Because Evoker isn't the spec, Evoker is the class, Drek'thir is the race. So what people are asking in chat is, why do you have Drek'thir be the race, Evoker be the class, but it's only the Drek'thir that can be Evoker? So why didn't you just call it Drek'thir and be done with it? Just have different specs for it, right? I have a logic answer, Drek'thir are the people, and Evoking is what they do, dum-dums. Yes. We are aware, Luna. We are aware, but we don't need your logic here. We're busy arguing a very, like, mute point, but still a point that we would like to argue. You know, maybe the race will get other classes later on, reverse of the current theory. That could also happen. Actually, I see that happening. That's more likely than the Evoker going to other classes, or other races. Would be, yes, uh, eventually Drek'thir would get the, ac would get access to other uh, classes, and so it needs uh, a class name. So that is also possible. We could probably um, look at it. I did say mute point because I didn't mean mood point. I just mean, I mean, like, it's a muted point. We're not really arguing something that should be viewed as logical because the logic answer is too easy. But it's also not really a mood point because a mood point would be completely nonsensical, which this isn't. This is actually a discussion that you can have. Um, so I used a word to make up a new meaning for it, effectively. Because I couldn't think of a word that would describe what I wanted to fucking say. Um, are the fingers of a mage? Totally fine. Same same mage breathing fire. Well, slow down. A mage breathing fire? How, how would that even work? Like that, You're crazy right now, paranoid. Like, that's fucking nuts, bro. Shut the fuck up. Uh, uh, what? What? A mage breathing fire. Lungs, bro. Your lungs wouldn't be able to handle that. What are you even saying? Um, that's nuts. <laughs> monks, no, monks don't breathe fire. Monks drink alcohol and then spit it out, and that's where fire breath comes from. Don't try and trick Blizzard here. They know what they're doing. Um, all right, so the Drakthir are going to be able to participate in the dragon riding system and mechanics too, Grim confirms. Drakthir have wings, so they get to fly and they use the same style of momentum and gravity that dragon riding drakes do. During their starter experience, you get introduced to the new mechanics with tutorials and all that stuff. Heading into building the expansion, knowing that we wanted to create this feature, we had to set up the environment to match. 
I've only gotten to see it myself recently and it shocked me how much it brought me into the world. Being engaged in the act of moving around while flying is very different for WoW and made me see the environment in a new way. Dragon Race wearing armor made out of dragon scales will be leather face equivalent. Mavalo, it I mean, they don't wear leather though. They they wear male, so that's how they solve that problem. Because if they could wear leather, where does that leather come from? You might just be wearing your own fucking brother. Right, so th that that takes care of that weird conversation that would have been had to have. Um Demon Hunters, hey Blizz, we have wings. Can we fly? No. Scaly furries, we have wings. Can we fly? Yes. Truth. Uh, Dractor being able to fly themselves is actually exciting. I do actually like the idea of them, but so what Ian explained is they're not going to have the same level of dragon riding that dragons will have, but you'll have sort of a muted version of it, if that makes sense. So it's sort of like a, a, a revised version of dragon riding but even the dragons if they actually want to do all the cool shit for dragon riding will need to get on their dragon and do their thing give my parents i made my own armor i'm an edgy dragon there you go uh, and with that it's worth noting that dragon riding is limited to dragon isles we made these giant expansive zones so that it would work as a gameplay mechanic and for people on a variety of different hardware um, we don't want to have you fly into a bunch of creatures and then have them pop up around you. We're designing the whole outdoor game world with dragon riding in mind. Also, we don't want to invalidate all of the many hundreds of mounts that our players have collected up until now. But I still wish that this moves forward in the future. They, for the love of fuck, tell me that dragon riding isn't just going to be a dragon flight expansion. Like, have this become something else, but don't just retire it. Um, puts the lotion on the scales. There you go. Revamping old systems and bringing the WoW UI into 2022. In recent months, we've seen the WoW team at Blizzard provide community-focused updates and changes to the experience. From quality of life updates that address specific feedback through the recent re revelation that Horde Alliance players playing together was finally a thing, with World of War Dragonflight representing version 10.0 of WoW, hitting that nice big version number means more than new stories to dig into, new dungeons to master, new zones to explore. It means a continued focus on taking a broader look at World of Warcraft and making meaningful changes. A large part of that started from the community-centric patch 915, looking at different quality of life features we could add. Dude, can you imagine if Blizzard started listening to the community five years ago? They look at all the things they're doing for the community just in the last year that they've started to listen to the fucking community. Can you imagine where this game would have been if they started listening in like 7.1 or maybe 7.2 even? Can you imagine where this game would be already? Like... A large part of this started from the community-centric 915 looking at different quality of life features we could add to the game that players have been asking for. Jeremy says, Not necessarily at the same time, but sort of in parallel with that, we were thinking about how we're coming back to Azeroth in that classic Warcraft fantasy. Maybe I wouldn't be playing League of Legends Aram right now if they did? True. Very true. Dragonflying sounds a lot like artifact weapons and covenants, as in something that you slowly earn and will not be carried into the next expansion. Paranoid, but there is, you can see how there is a way for it to be added in the next expansions, right? I love how they quote that having this expansion being 10.0 is the reason they have to tell such strong stories. Yeah, man, you have to give more effort for those numbers. Exactly, money. Like, very true. Like, everyone knows, the only expansions that really mattered in World of Warcraft is 1.0, 5.0, and 10.0. Uh, 11.0, 12.0, 13.0, 14.0, not gonna matter, 5, 15.0, that's the big one. That's the one where you have to once again dig deep and really make that, that groundbreaking kind of fucking leaps and bounds, right? All right. So what are some of the elements that maybe we haven't touched in a really long time? The talent tree was one that hadn't been touched in a number of expansion releases, and the UI has existed since the origination of WoW. That was taking everything and making it feel like 2022, whether that's making the map a little bit smaller, more contained, but also having a larger visible area, allowing you to move around just about everything on your screen, just making everything feel new and fresh and refreshed for a new expansion. I hope I'm wrong, but I don't see there being an 11.0. Thumb one, if they can actually deliver on all of the things that they have promised in this expansion, I, I don't see why not. They don't have they didn't overpromise a hell of a lot. There's not 
massive promises made. Most of what they promised, I can see them doing without fail. So I don't, I don't see like I, I don't see any issues here, whatsoever. Yeah, pretty much uh, the Final Fantasy UI mechanics, Luna. So classic pandas and dragons only matter. Truth, as opposed to modernizing the talent tree, this revamp came about due to the resurgence of popularity of World of Warcraft Classic. We knew heading in that we wanted to revisit the talent system because we've been using the same one since Mists of Pandaria. Grainberger explains, It is a lot of things we like, but did lose some things from older versions of WoW. Very early on, we held a sort of internal summit for the designers to just pitch all kinds of wild ideas. If you could have any talent system and there's no production cost, what would you do? Some really wild stuff was thrown out, but it was cool to go through that process and see what aspects everyone kind of touched on. Common threads that we all kept coming back to. And you ended up doing the thing that players have been asking for for a long time. I tell you what, Blizzard, instead of doing your developer summits, just fucking read your forums for the love of fuck. And don't just do it when you're in trouble. Every once in a while, like just every six months, head over to the forums, read a couple of posts. Just, just get a feel for what the community has been saying for fucking years now. UI to customize in the pre-patch. Probably gonna, this, this sounds like a pre-patch sort of thing. Uh, both the talents, you'll probably get the talents and the new UI in the pre-patch. Absolutely. Um, they had a pitch meeting in short. Optimal book, pretty much, yes. One would think that pitch meetings would happen at the beginning of every expansion, no? Like if you were making a game and you had all these overpaid developers, you know, wouldn't you have a pitch meeting every expansion to sort of figure out what could we do really well for, like... They're speaking as if this is brand new. They've never actually done this, which based on the lawsuits, we know they haven't. Um, for the new talent system, it's definitely inspired by WoW Classic, but that separation of core class and specialization gives us a lot of control and ability to tune different portions of it. It's giving players the control to diversify their builds across different content without losing any of the flexibility and conveniences that we've built up over the years. You can still change your talents in town, you don't have to go pay gold like in Classic. If you want to try out something new, awesome. If you want to save different builds for different types of content, great. We have loadouts, so you can save your Mythic Plus build, your Raid build, your Arena build. That thing, that, that thing of figuring out what works for you and then creating a library, having it all ready to go. I have one question though. What if I want to change a talent, say, in the open world? Like one talent. I, I, don't, I don't just want to choose a different uh, loadout. What if I just want to change a single talent in the open world? It doesn't make sense why I can't, though. My worry now is if there's if there could be too many talents with how big those trees are. I don't think so, Kamikins. Like, I don't think there can be too many. There's not enough there to be too many. Clear Mind is similar. will probably exist for that. Yeah, but I don't even understand why you have the Tome of Clear Mind. Is it really such a big problem if someone can just change a fucking talent? Like, why is that a problem? Feels a bit useless, you know? But Bliss seems to see, see a different team. Yeah, you should just give people the ability to change their talents at will. Uh, but I guess Blizzard seems to think there's a reason for it. Um, I think keeping it unavailable for PvP is fair, but out in open world, yeah. Just in the open world, you should be able to change your talents at a whim. You know, I'm standing outside the dungeon. I'm about to go into the dungeon. I quickly want to make a couple of changes to my talents because I, I, I want to do something different this time. Let's just go, you know. No Tomb of, Tome of the Clear Mind needed. I'm just changing some shit. It feels more like Tome of the Clear Mind was invented so that inscription, like, inscription would mean something. Like, scribes would actually have a reason for existing. <laughs> As it were, you know. It's not like the Tome of Clear Mind is necessary. But what else are scribes going to do if they're not going to make Tome of a Clear Mind the whole fucking time? Um, you can have infinite amount of preset talent loadouts. You can swap at any point out of combat. Inscription is the rated stepchild of professions. True. Um, we do it all the time in Guild Wars 2. Open it up and let players play the game. Your question should always be the following. Whenever it comes to thinking about removing something or adding something, the question should always be... Will removing or adding this thing make the game more fun? If answer yes, do the thing. Be it remove or add. If answer yes, do the thing. That's it. 
That's, that's, that's it. If it's going to break the game, then obviously that's not going to make it more fun. So then don't do the fucking thing. <laughs> it really, as far as I'm concerned, it, it is as easy as it would be. We want to go really deep with all these different aspects. The new version of Daily Quest is going to be transferring over to a very activity-centric system. Oh, okay, here we get to something interesting. The new, the new version of Daily Quests is going to be transferring over to a very activity-centric system that feels like you're always making progress. And unlike Covenants, you don't have to pick one of these different reputations to gain renown. You can do all of them. We're looking at how we can co incorporate alt friendliness in the same way that we did in 9152. So it's all a big refresh for the outdoor world. I have one major question here. Say, for example, I go from Renown level 1 to Renown level 15, yeah? Am I going to see physical changes in the world? Like, will the world physically change to the things that I'm doing? Or is this going to be more a case of, you know, basically dailies and world quests as we always have them in World of Warcraft, where you've basically saved the whole of Maldraxxus, and yet the same war in Maldraxxus is still taking place. The same world quests are still there. I, I really hope that there's some level of world progression. So you can see the world changing. Jan Ratka, how you doing, brother? Maybe not the world itself, but maybe it will allow access to f further content. Zerberus Final Fantasy XIV in Heaven's Ward have beast tribes, like the clicky people, where you do a couple of quests for them and their hub physically fucking changes like the hub physically looks different as you do those quests if heaven's ward already had the technology to do that then surely world of warcraft has the technology to change the world even if it is just the the area where you pick up the quests for uh, the dragon flights even if you just see a little bit of physical progression there it could really do a lot to make all your hard work feel like fucking something, you know? When I mean, we look at the Ishgard reconstruction process, I mean, there's, what, three places that, that I think is completely reconstructed from the ground up, patch after patch. So, yes, a few meshes. It's not that hard. Pretty much, right? They definitely have it. Even back in Kata, Molten Front. Uh, we also had it in, um, in, 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 uh, oh my god, Legion. Uh, fuck, what's that called? What's that song called again? Um, bro, Suramar. Fucking hell. I, I thought I had an aneurysm there. Suramar also had that, that sort of notable progression of the zone itself, you know? Not the zone, but the area, the, the sort of hub where you pick shit up. So clearly, World of Warcraft can do that. Um, Soul of Gabriel? I don't think so. Because ultimately, the zones in, in Shadowlands also had loading screens, and yet they didn't do it there. So it's clearly not, not about the loading screens between zones that make that big of a difference. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I, I don't think that's the reason they're not doing it. I think it's just laziness. Because it, it's a whole lot to do for very little, if you think about it. Like giving people visual progression within a zone for the quest that they do and the way they progress through the zone is a small, it's even smaller than quality of life because it isn't really quality of life even. It's immersion more than anything, right? So you're basically putting in a hell of a lot of developer time to increase immersion into your game. And it's not like not having it there sort of destroys immersion. It, it's just, it's a nice to have. And more often than not, whenever it comes to nice to haves, Blizzard tends to err on the side of fuck you, um, which is, you know, a, a problem as far as I'm concerned. Um, we'll optimize the crap out of anything, but this talent system will make it so that the margin and performance are very small. They did an ice ground, so they definitely can do it. You might need a quick fade to black or a fly, uh, flyover cutscene to hide the swapping, though. I I'm sure you could do many of those things and probably more. Um, I, we're, I, I'd have to see more about this renowned system that they want to implement. Story hints as the wait for Dragonflight begins. With both an alpha preview and beta event planned, Blizzard isn't quite ready to reveal the release date for World of Warcraft Dragonflight. That said, with the return to Azeroth and the return to a more grounded story that wasn't about some immediate cataclysmic event, we were curious about what it meant to visit the Dragon Isles. What would players discover? What stories would be told? With the Dragonflights, uh, if they could be, if they couldn't be defenders of Azeroth anymore, 
What is their future? Jeremy ponders. That's really what we're going to be exploring, and we'll be getting into their stories as you land on the Dragon Isles. You're going to be meeting with Dragonspawn and Dragon King, some of our ancient friends from Blackwing Lair, upraised for a new generation, learning about their purpose in Dragon Society. We're going to find the life pools of the Raid Dragonflight, where their sacred oath to the Titans was put forth, helping them regain some of their power. Visiting all of the different Dragonflights is a little bit similar to what we did in Wrath of the Lich King. But these are fully fledged areas, and many of them have dungeons associated with them, helping the Black Dragonflight take back their defensive cit citadel, helping the Green Dragonflight secure their grove. The main Dragonflights aren't all of the dragons in World of Warcraft either. We've met a bunch of other dragons, Stone Dragons, Thunder Dragons. Here we're meeting another group of dragons called the Primalists. They follow a group of primal incarnates, followers of Galakrond, Ancient, huge proto-dragons that choose not to side with the Titans. They believe that everyone should be subservient to dragon kind because they're big and powerful. Facing off against dragons, dragon versus dragon, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Jeremy Ponders is one of the lead developers. I don't know lead developer for what in World of Warcraft, but he is one of the lead developers. The followers of Galakrond. What do you think the chances are that the followers of Galakrond manages to reanimate Galakrond. They will? Yeah, we know his skeleton is gone, so it might be that they stole it. I mean, yeah, I would not be surprised. They'll try, I get a feeling we'll stop them. Potential good story, so 0%. That would be a potentially good story. Maybe not in his full form, but an aspect of him, sure. Dude, I want him in his full form. I'm not even lying. I want him in his full, glorious form. This big-ass fucking drake that just consumes everything. That's what I want. Harry Potter universe, when the Ministry of Magic had the mantra of magic is might. So we get to shove another giant rock down his throat. I'm game if that's true. I mean, and it would be sort of the perfect thing, right? Towards the end of the expansion. You have this entire expansion where you don't really have that world level threat. And then you have Galakrond, which could potentially be a world level threat that you have to stop. And then maybe we can have the Sword of Sargeras eventually be fucking used, like Digimark just said there. I think I think all of this could be really cool. Rock would be big enough. Black Rock Mountain. Yeah, just shove your dick in his mouth. That's pretty much all you need, Zerberus. He'll gobble that shit down. Like, he eats everything. Wake him up and have him destroy everything that might be interesting for next X-Pack. No, for the love of fuck, let, let's not have him destroy everything again. Azeroth is teetering on the brink of destruction as things stand already. Let's not have more destruction and, and just death rain upon Azeroth. I just want a nice, clean, good expansion that, that deals with dragons and the history of World of Warcraft, and we'll see how it goes, right? I've been covering the stuff for four hours. You're not once mentioned uh, the only thing that mattered from the reveal, Stony Tony. It's, um, I will say, what was remarkable about Tony... I cared more about Tony in the five seconds that we've known him than I did about Zuval in all the time that we've spent with him. So something is amiss because I actually genuinely didn't want Stony to die. You know, I kind of, I, I, I kind of thought, "Fuck, this is sad. He's dying. That's not cool." And then she saved him. I was like, oh, "Good job, good job. I'm, I'm glad that Tony was saved." And if his name isn't Tony, it, I will fucking riot. If Blizzard does not call him Tony, it is Riot. I don't care if it's immersion breaking. I don't care about the story. His name should be Tony. <clears throat> Tony Montana. Exactly that. Tony the Stony. <laughs> yeah. Just, just do that. Okay, but that aside, I think this might be the lowest rated WoW expansion cinematic so far. Even in personal opinion. I agree. As, as a pure cinematic, it is definitely the worst. Very little hype moments. My brother's actually pointed out something that I'm not necessarily in agreement with, but I, I will run it by you guys in case you agree. My brother's biggest problem with it is that the expansion feels to feel good. There's no darkness. There's no like encroaching philosophical problem. Or, or moral problem that you have to deal with. It's just sort of feel good. Um, and that was their biggest problem with it. Why do you think that's a good thing? I thought the cinematic was good. Not great, but good. Mist started the same way. I don't agree with that. Mist of Andaria has one of the greatest scenes in cinematic history of World of Warcraft ever. Period. Ever. If you don't, like, Jesus. I, I can't believe you guys are saying that. 
think I'm gonna have to, uh... Like, this is one of the greatest scenes in the history of World of Warcraft ever. And I'll show you exactly which scene is the greatest ever. Right there. This one. This scene right here, favorite fucking scene in any cinematic of World of Warcraft ever. The look of that orc as he's looking at that fucking panda is it, just next level, dude. <laughs> I love that scene. So, no, I actually think Mr. Pandaria had a brilliant cinematic. It is. It's sort of that sibling rivalry kind of thing. We're fine to fight each other, but as soon as someone interferes, it's us against them. Until we've taken care of the outsider, and then we'll go back to fighting each other again. I think that was perfect. The, the Dragonflight cinematic didn't have any of these real, like, impactful moments. But then at the same time, maybe that's a good thing because none of the previous expansions, like the last two expansions of the Matrix, were insanely good and the expansions turned out to be complete shite. So maybe a bad cinematic means a good expansion? Like, you know, maybe this is the turning point. From here on forward, we only want bad cinematics because bad cinematics mean good expansions. <laughs> Mop it a good cinematic, but there was no preconception on what the expansion was about other than pandas. I, in Cusatorium, I don't think the reason why people don't like the expansion uh, cinematic for Dragonflight is because we don't know who the bad guy is. I think the reason people don't like it is very little happened. They they effectively had the Dragonflight arrive. You, like, Tony waking up was kind of like something. But outside of that, nothing else really happened. It was just the Dragonflight returning home. And I, I think that's what a lot of people sort of had a problem with. It, it it didn't do anything to set up any sort of expectation for what could be. At least in, in the Panda expansion, seeing the pandas in the Panda homeworld, you had an expectation that was created and seeing the Horde and the Alliance fight each other, that was another expectation that was immediately set up. But dragons we have known about for a really long time. So dragons showing up is not necessarily the like the the big brain thing that people would have wanted to see but it's exactly in that that i find hope because maybe it's not the worst thing in the world dragonfly is supposed to be more feel good it's jarring in comparison but the lack of expectation might be the most beneficial part also yeah uh, it doesn't come with that whole you expect so much and then you're sort of let down i i think the other thing that is absolutely going to work in blizzard's favor throughout this expansion, like 100%, uh, is the, the lack of expectation. Everyone's expectations for the last two expansions or following the last two expansions is so low that if Blizzard just doesn't fuck up, like they don't even have to hit it out of the park. As long as they don't step in shit, I think people are gonna be happy, you know? As long as there's not another lawsuit that comes and now you find out that not only were they cube crawling, but they were also sticking their asses in other people's faces while they were sleeping and invading people's homes and, and going on a massive crime spree across California. You know, as long as none of that shit comes out, I feel like people will be like, yeah, this is a good expansion. It, it delivered a really strong sense and feel. Everyone's sort of happy, no questions asked. You know, so I can see how this can work in Blizzard's favor.